always a special privilege and pleasure to come to Manchester. Um, my wife and I have been coming here, for, I'm trying to calculate, but probably 35 years. Um, the first time we visited to take a look at Hildeen, uh, right after Peggy Beckwith died, uh, the house was not restored, the equinox was closed. It was quite a different time. There were plenty of outlets, but the, everything else was <laughs> different. And um, I've, thanks to Hildeen and my friend Seth Bongartz, who is here, I've been back many times speaking at Hildeen. Um, I even spoke at Hildeen a few years ago to the New York State Funeral Directors Convention. <laughs> which interestingly was one of the jolliest gigs I ever had. <laughs> Those people really know how to have fun, especially in Manchester. And just a special shout out to Nate and Harriet Boone who have always been here when I'm here. I've known them for decades and um, it's just wonderful to see them and um, unchanging as always. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to remark on is um, it's just been interesting since I accepted this uh, very lovely invitation to come back. Um, at least three people in this organization or vicinity have retired. I'm trying really hard not to take it personally. And Christopher, who I've been in contact with for two days, failed to show up yesterday in Brattleboro, allegedly because he went to see Cher, which I guess is a legitimate excuse if we can see the ticket stubs. But, um, well, let's get serious uh, for a bit. Um, I'm, I'm going to offer tonight what can only be described as a speech about a speech. Um, and here's a spoiler alert, the speech was a masterpiece or obviously I wouldn't be talking about it. Um, it's the kind of speech that won considerable attention in its day and has ever since. In fact, the people who specialize in Lincoln almost universally now consider Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address to be even greater. I'm not sure I'm quite in this camp yet because I've been doing this for a long time. Even greater than the Gettysburg Address. Um, maybe not quite in the popular imagination. So most of you, I think, already know the speech, at least the most famous part of it, with malice toward none and charity for all. That phrase long ago became part of the national vocabulary and, of course, the consoling words that are supposed to reconcile us in any times of challenge and trouble. I think the speech, because of the fame of that final paragraph, is underjudged or misjudged and underappreciated. In fact, it's much more than a call for reconciliation. It's much less than that, and it's much more than that in another way. Um, and I think it's misunderstood as well as being Lincoln's call for North and South to get together forget about all the tough things that had happened in the four preceding years, the Civil War, the fight by the South to sustain slavery and the North ultimately to eradicate it. Um, a line as brilliant and merciful as with malice toward none and charity for all, I think is bound to be somewhat misunderstood and well remembered at the same time. And tends to win more attention for one part of the speech than for the sum of its parts. And the rest of the address more, I think, de more than deserves attention as well. I think in giving it its belated due, which is happening, as I mentioned, among historians, it's, it's worth looking at it in its entirety. So let's go back to an era in which presidential eloquence was expected when um, I actually have pause for expected laugh. <laughs> I'm not going to be partisan. Presidential eloquence was expected. Pundits were not amazed when presidents stayed on message and on speech. When words were valued, orators were cultural superstars in, in the Civil War era. 
and politicians, even in the most divisive age in American history, yes, much, much more divisive than our own, were generally respected and admired. Enough so to inspire those who created the Lincoln Memorial, which I shamelessly show you here by way of announcing that my newest book is about the man who created the statue for the Lincoln Memorial, Daniel Chester French, uh, inspire them to include not just the words of the Gettysburg Address in 1922 when it was opened, which, were, which was arguably more famous by far than the second inaugural, but at Daniel Chester French's suggestion, the, the second inaugural as well. And there it is inscribed on three tablets in the wall. One of my, our accomplishments at the, uh, at the Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, which Christopher mentioned, was that we used your hard-earned taxpayer money to re-ink the words of the Gettysburg Address and the second inaugural, which I'm not even gonna tell you how much it costs. But anyway, um, first some crucial background. And I think, how do we understand the man who's capable of writing this kind of poetry? Um, it's very hard to fathom. People ask me what the secret is um, of his self-education and his development. And you know, it's like an artist like Daniel Chester French. We know his background, we know what training he got, but how he actually created a statue, that's just, that's just um, a gift. It's magical. And Lincoln had no formal education to speak of. In the backwoods of Kentucky, he, the only fortunate thing that happened in his youth following his mother's death at his early age was that his stepmother brought books into their home for the first time. And he devoured uh, Aesop's fables, the Bible, uh, a book called Scott's Elocution, which taught youngsters how to orate by printing Shakespeare's soliloquies, most famous soliloquies, soliloquies that he memorized, never forgot. Newspapers, he got hold of newspapers when he was a teenager, St. Louis papers, was reading pro-Whig political argumentation from an early age. His stepmother attested to the fact that he read newspapers as often as he read the Bible. He read great speeches of the American past, Washington's farewell address, the, the Hayne-Webster debate in Congress. Somehow, he escaped this childhood and went off to live on his own in somewhat equally primitive circumstances in a mill town called New Salem, Illinois, armed only with this hunger to learn and not, not really much else. And it was there in his first home as an adult that he developed the justly famous <laughs> skill he had at telling funny stories, um, which he did to the um, horror of his cabinet members at the least expected times and for the rest of his life. Um, he became a legendary uh, courtroom lawyer capable of brilliant summations before juries, um, and as I'm sure you know, became an adroit, nimble debater. Was doing that on the political stump in Illinois for 20 years, even before he engaged in his famous debates with Stephen Douglas. And there was something about Lincoln's style that was different. Orators of the day used purple language, broad gestures, biblical allusions in which they identified gospel passages for reference. They were grandiose, maybe because he lacked the stentorian voice that most orators had and was naturally awkward. Lincoln did not gesture wildly. As his law partner said, he never swatted bees in the air, which was a sort of a frontier way of saying he didn't gesture. Uh, he also said that if you put a silver dollar on the floor, where Lincoln, when Lincoln began a speech, when you came later, it would be undisturbed, meaning he didn't roam. Our, t our tech professional asked me today if I was gonna go back, roam back and forth. I'm not a roamer, only because I'm holding on for dear life. But he didn't, he didn't roam either, he stayed put. He was different. His first 
call for political support uh, came in the 1830s and he said, I am humble Abraham Lincoln. My politics are short and sweet like an old woman's dance. I love that. If elected, I shall be grateful. If not, it will be all the same. He lost, so he learned a lesson that maybe modesty was, uh, could only carry you so far. Um, he did get elected to Congress in 1846. Here he is posing uh, at the Springfield photographers with his hair beautifully slicked back to celebrate his election to the Congress. And he became famous, maybe infamous in Congress, by opposing the Mexican War, which was generally popular throughout the country. But again, self-deprecatingly, attacking a military man who supported the war. Um, uh, Lewis Cass, who was running for president and was touting his military record. Lincoln stands before Congress to about the same number of people who were here in those days and said, do you know I am a military hero too? Yes, sir. In the days of the Black Hawk Indian War, I fought, bled, and came away. It is quite certain I didn't break my sword, for I had none to break, but I bent a musket pretty badly once. I had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes, and though I never fainted from loss of blood, I can truly say I was often very hungry. That was his self-deprecating summation of his military experience. Slavery and the debate over the extension of slavery aroused him and made him something more than a humorous public speaker. It fired him, it inspired him, it outraged him, until in 1854, he would rise in Peoria, Illinois to oppose the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which might have spread slavery throughout the West if settlers voted to incorporate slavery. He said, this declared indifference but as I must think, covert real zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites. It causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity and especially because it forces so many really good men amongst ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principle of civil liberty. Anyone who suggests today that Lincoln was indifferent about slavery before the Civil War need only look at that speech in Peoria seven years before the Civil War. And of course, he brought his biblical knowledge to bear four years after that Peoria speech in announcing his candidacy for the US Senate against Stephen Douglas before the debates started. And I know you know this phrase as well, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided it will become all one thing or all the other. And that is right out of the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke. Just as a household could not be divided, Lincoln um, was asserting here, a kingdom could not be divided, as it says in the Bible, and nor could a nation. Keep in mind, his audiences of the day would have gotten the reference um, it was a church-going uh, audience in the West. Lincoln never had to say to quote scripture or to quote from the book of Matthew, book 12. He spoke to an informed religious audience. They immediately understood that he alluded to scripture without quoting it. And other flashes of brilliance will fo would follow. He spoke in my hometown, New York City, in 1860 as a lecturer um, and, and astonished a crowd that expected him to be a primitive Western debater by reminding them, let us have faith that right makes might. 
It was a transformative speech in his career, and he went on, as you know, to win the Republican nomination for president that year. I think his real transformation as an orator came one year later. By the way, and, and for those of you who were already caught up in the maelstrom of a presidential election that's not really happening for another 17 months, Lincoln spoke at Cooper Union in February 1860. He did not speak again until February 1861. No speeches, no comment. Nobody, po politicians, did, presidential candidates did not speak publicly. Stephen Douglas did a little bit. How many would, no, I won't, I won't take a poll. Um, <laughs> but when he starts to speak again, it's magnificent. And it's a new style. He's toned and down and compressed even the, the minimalist style that he had introduced in politics. So when he takes his departure from Springfield, now with a beard looking like this, this was taken only a few days before he gave this speech, he famously said, I now leave not knowing when or whether ever I may return with a task before me greater than that which faced Washington. Here my children have been born and one lies buried. Without the assistance of that divine being, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. I, I presented this speech um, to President George H.W. Bush and his family and his friends in Houston. I didn't read the speech, the actor Sam Waterston read the speech. I would do these setups and the actor would read the speech. And after the performance was over, President Bush came up and, and he had tears in his eyes. And usually people react to the biggest hits, Gettysburg, the second inaugural. And we thanked him and we said, what, which of the speeches moved you the most? And he said this one, um, because it's hard to explain what it feels like if you're leaving your home for the presidency to leave a child behind buried. And that's what moved President Bush and moved us as well. Again, these new, this new kind of, of, of style that cuts to the essentials. A few weeks later, he rises uh, on the portico of the Capitol. I promise you he's in there somewhere. We've never really been able to find him, but he's under that wooden platform um, there, the little wooden canopy on the, on the platform in front of the Capitol. And um, read the words that uh, President-elect Obama read uh, in Chicago the day after, the night of his election. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of their nature. All short words, but very expansive and complex sentences, and again, a brand new style. Um, as he would again build on uh, in his message to Congress in 1862, trying to get Congress to understand that the Emancipation Proclamation would indeed be signed in one month, even though there was a lot of resistance to doing it. We cannot escape history. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. And of course, the zenith of his rhetorical career at Gettysburg, this photograph was taken eight days before he, he spoke at Gettysburg, and the vow that government of, by, and for the people would never perish from the earth. A speech so surpassingly great that it had spawned a cottage industry of myths and legends. Did he write it on the back of an envelope in a train to Gettysburg? The answer is no. Did he wait till the last minute to write it? The answer is no. He actually worked really hard on it. And um, 
I think the movie Lincoln gave a more accurate view in a passing snippet when uh, an actor goes up to Daniel Day-Lewis as Lincoln and said that was a pretty good speech. And Lincoln says, not Gettysburg, but a final speech. And he said, well, it was long. I didn't have time to write a shorter speech. <laughs> I love that line. Um, by the way, what is true about Gettysburg, I think is fascinating. The unknown things about Gettysburg. One is he almost didn't go. His little boy came down with smallpox. And um, his wife begged him not to go, remembering that only 18 months before, their middle son, Willie, had been ill with typhoid fever, and the doctor said he would get better, and he did not only not get better, he died in the White House. Mary Lincoln never got over that and begged him, if you go, she said, if you go, he'll die. He felt he had to go to consecrate the, the fields of battle where so many thousands of people had died. Not until he was on horseback going out to the cemetery the morning after his arrival did a telegram finally arrive saying that his son had improved. But Lincoln himself was not at his best when he gave the speech. How do we know? Because when he was on the train a few hours after speaking, on his way back to Washington, he excused himself and lay down in the railroad car his valet, um, William Johnson, an African-American man, covered his head with a towel. And when he got back to Washington, guess what? He had smallpox. And he was ill for weeks. Um, he, he loved lying in bed, and people would come to the door and say, um, you know, there were people waiting in the lobby to try to get political office or favors, and Lincoln, who was filled with a rash on his face, said, well, have them come in here. I finally have something I can give to everybody. <laughs> A side note about the valet, I love that, I, I, it's a very moving story. William Johnson accompanied Lincoln from Springfield to Washington in 1861. When he got there, Lincoln wanted to hire him onto the White House staff, but the White House staff was exclusively Irish American, and they would not allow a person of color to join the staff. So Lincoln tried to get him a job in the Navy Department, which was an integrated branch of service from the beginning. No, we have no job in the Navy Department. They finally got him a position in the War Department, and his routine was to be a messenger, a clerk, a messenger during the morning, and in the afternoon he would go to the White House and give Lincoln his daily shave and see what he needed and get him ready for evening events. So William Johnson went with Lincoln to Gettysburg, came back, I'm assuming, attended him in his illness. There's no other word until a Washington newspaper notes that the president's aide, William Johnson, has died. So I'm assuming he died of smallpox. Lincoln personally collected his salary warrants while he was ill, made sure his wife, made sure his wife got his salary. I'm not sure about pensions. I don't think he got a pension. But the, the coda to the story is that when Johnson was buried in what is now Arlington Cemetery, Lincoln paid for a headstone um, on his burial site. He did not build a headstone for his own father, even though he promised his mother, his stepmother, that he would do so. But William Johnson has a headstone that says, William Johnson, citizen, paid for by Abraham Lincoln. Just a coda to uh, the story of his zenith of oratory. So things have changed in Lincoln's life. He's seen sacrifice firsthand, hundreds of thousands of casualties. He's visited Gettysburg, the scene of the most carnage that has occurred in the Civil War. He is quoting Shakespeare to say, the heavens are hung with black. And a few months after Gettysburg, which, by the way, is often discussed the battle as the turning point in the Civil War, it's clear that it's not really a turning point. It may be the so-called high water mark of the Confederacy, but it's only the midpoint of the war. There are more casualties after Gettysburg than before. The war continues to exact a grueling and brutal uh, 
toll. And when Lincoln says the heavens are hung in black, he means that every household in the United States is eventually touched with death. And under this cloud, Abraham Lincoln decides he must seek a second term, which was not automatic then. No one had run for a second term since Andrew, ja since Andrew Jackson. Lincoln was the first in more than 30 years. And in that terrible spring and summer of 1864, as Grant plunges ahead slowly in Virginia, again, huge casualties, unheard of casualties in the Overland Campaign, Lincoln is convinced by August of 1864 that he will lose. And his major piece of writing, because again, he doesn't speak out during the campaign, is to write this memorandum saying that this morning, as for some days past, it seems likely that this administration will not be reelected. After the election, it will be our duty to work with the new administration to save the union before the inauguration, knowing that if a Democrat is elected, he will do nothing to save the union or sustain emancipation after the election. If you see fold marks around the edges of this, that's because Lincoln folded it into quarters, sealed it, and asked his cabinet to sign it sight unseen. Very strange thing for even a lawyer to do. And they therefore added their pledge to work with the administration. And meanwhile, he began working with Frederick Douglass to see if as many enslaved people could be informed of their legal freedom in the South, in the border states particularly, before the election. Um, even in New York, where this campaign print and cartoon was made, it seemed to be clear that Lincoln would lose. Um, again, Frederick Douglass, and this is a contemporary picture of Douglass as he would have looked around the time he first met Lincoln in the White House, is enlisted to spread the word of inauguration. They make a plan. Everything changes miraculously after General Sherman captures Atlanta on September 1st, 1864. Suddenly it's as if the whole Union, the whole Union electorate breathes a collective sigh of relief. And Lincoln suddenly has the momentum at his back. And as you know, he was in fact re-elected President of the United States by a very healthy margin, 55 to 45 percent um, in November. And that brings us, I know some of you may think this is a long preamble, but that brings us to March 4th, 1865. And this is a very rare photograph of crowds just beginning to assemble in front of the U.S. Capitol. How Lincoln found time to write anything, much less something so extraordinary and so gorgeous with all of the pressures on him even after his reelection is another astounding thing. Um, well, what did he write? And that's what, after all, has brought you here tonight. Um, a lesser man might have chosen a victory speech, um, sort of a triumphalist vindication of all the sacrifice and devastation. Uh, might have added a condemnation of white Southerners alone for fighting so relentlessly to save their brutal system. Um, or maybe a specific message about how Reconstruction would be effectuated. Because by this point, it's only a matter of weeks before the Confederate Army yields and surrenders. No one knew what Lincoln's plan was, except that he had earlier used the word Reconstruction and said that he would not require a majority of white voters to pledge loyalty to the Union before a state could be readmitted to the Union and elect a legislature. And there were people who were worried about that, who thought he was being too lenient. Would he explain what he really meant to occur? Um, in fact, as Lincoln would explain that day, it would be both. It would be a merciful reconciliation, but it would also have a harsh element to it. And that's 
what we tend to forget and what I will get to. He did it all in 750 words. Now that's two and a half times the length of the Gettysburg Address, but it's still um, with Kennedy and one other inaugural, I think Washington's second, the shortest inaugural address. Here we have thousands and thousands of people gathering, and they really got about eight minutes um, of Abraham Lincoln. As I say, Abraham Lincoln had changed much in the four years since he had arrived in Washington. This is a pretty dramatic rendering of that change. Uh, the man at the right uh, weighed about 40 pounds less than the man who had arrived uh, in Washington with that big luxuriant beard, which the White House barbers by February 65 had trimmed down to a goatee. He was sunken and he was uh, unwell. His energy was sapped. He wasn't sure, even as he was ready to take the oath of office for a brand new term, whether he would live to see its conclusion. These are two life masks that were made five years apart. Um, and here's another view where you see the change even more dramatically. Lincoln's private secretary looked at these masks about 20 years later and noticed what we notice here. The first is a man young for his years, a face full of life, of energy, of vivid aspiration. The other is so sad and peaceful that a famous sculptor thought it was a death mask, a look as of on one on whom sorrow and care have done their worst without victory. Unspeakable sadness, but all sufficing strength. And he has a point because Lincoln is um, 52 years old in the photograph at left, and he's only 56 years old in the photograph at right. That's what the presidency and the war did to him. Now, put yourself back into the inaugural day of 1865. The process was totally different than, exa well, in exactly the reverse order of today's inaugurals. Today, a president is sworn in. He or she someday gives the, delivers the inaugural address. Then they all go back to the White House and there is a parade, right? The inaugural parade. Now, in those days, the parade was first. So Lincoln rides from the White House in back of floats, you know, 36 beautiful women, each representing a state of the Union, that kind of thing, marching bands, lots of soldiers, African-American soldiers and white soldiers. They get to the Capitol, and the order is at the Capitol, the speech will be first, and then the swearing in. So it's, slight, it's exactly the opposite of what it is now. And here is the scene. March 4th, 1865. I will show you the close-up of Lincoln, but some of you can see him to the left of that little white podium, sitting there with his, uh, with his arms folded in his lap in back of the podium, which he will be speaking from in just a few minutes. This is the first extensively photographed inaugural in American history. It hadn't been easy getting to this spot. Lincoln came in through the rotunda of the Capitol, walked from the back toward the Senate chamber. As he was walking, a, a, a wild-eyed person lunged forward in just a sort of a deranged moment, and the Washington police held him back. It was John Wilkes Booth, who planned to do something to him that day to prevent him from taking the oath. In fact, I promised I wouldn't turn around, but I will because I want to do this. He's up here. He goes out on the ledge with the owner of Ford's Theater, interestingly, to listen to the speech. Was he armed? Well, everyone was armed then. What did he have in mind? No one really knows. Um, before he got out to this perch, in those days, the vice president was inaugurated in the Senate chamber first. And Lincoln got there and he has chosen a new vice president, Andrew Johnson. Um, of Tennessee, the only Southern senator who did not leave the Union for the Confederacy. Sounded like to Lincoln like a great choice, except Johnson was drunk at the swearing in. Um, 
They later explained it was because he had a terrible cold and took brandy for fortification. <laughs> Should have had a Tylenol instead of the brandy. Lincoln said, take Johnson away and do not let him speak to anyone again. So he's not in a great mood um, as he begins speaking. He's, there he is sitting next to Andrew Johnson, an amazing close up. And as you can see, he's had a haircut just before the talk. He doesn't look very Lincoln-esque, except for his size. Um, the hair is cut way back. The beard, again, is just a little goatee. Johnson, I don't know, he's gonna be covering his, his face with his hat in a few minutes. And then he stands at the lectern. It's been cloudy all day. As Lincoln stands at this rostrum, the sun breaks through, and Lincoln admitted that it sent an electric jolt through him, and it made his heart jump. Um, as I said at the beginning, the speech is best remembered for the kind of pacific conclusion. But Lincoln devoted far more time in this speech to a ringing Old Testament justification for the long and bloody war. Um, examining both man's sins and divine providence and the inescapable sin of slavery. So he begins, and there he is holding the speech. Um, he holds it and reads it throughout. He does not do it from memory as Daniel Day-Lewis did, because um, there's the evidence he's holding the piece of paper. He begins simply by saying, at this second appearing, not appearance, at this second appearing to take the oath of office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Always beware of people who say, I'm gonna speak briefly. But you know, this was honest Abe, so he was gonna be honest. Four years earlier, he had constructed a legalistic argument against secession. Now, he was talking about victory almost won, the South on the verge of collapse. The speech will be just the way he described his Gettysburg speech, short, short, short. And here's the first page of his manuscript. How would he discuss the war? How could he summarize four years of destruction and 750,000 deaths? That would be the equivalent of the modern United States losing 11 million people in an event or a war. Well, this is how he did it. The progress of our arms upon which all else chiefly depends is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction to it is ventured. No details, no timetable, no chest thumping. Satisfactory and encouraging. That was as much as he would allow himself to boast about on this solemn but hopeful day. But who had responsibility for this carnage? On one level, Lincoln would put the blame directly on secessionists where it belonged. And he reminded them about what had happened in this plaza just four years earlier. On the occasion corresponding to this just four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it. Then he got specific for the only time. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union, without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the union and divide effects by negotiation. He's justifying what has happened since. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them, meaning the South, would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish, and the war came. Four words to describe four years of horror. But the blame he puts plainly with the secessionists. Think of that phrase for a moment, and the war came. What an amazing, I mean almost casual declaration. Suddenly the tense 
becomes passive, not condemnatory. He doesn't say, and they brought on war. He doesn't say, and we accepted war, and the war came. Uh, a statement of fact and almost a, re a re regretful acknowledgement of an unavoidable storm, as if mere human beings had been too weak or in some cases too selfish to prevent it. And that's exactly what Lincoln was getting at in this extraordinary talk. First, for the cause of the war, and again, he said it briefly but strongly, despite all the later generations who have looked for easier explanations, to Lincoln, it was obvious. Slavery, he calmly reminded his listeners and the readers who had, the millions of people who would read the text the next day in the papers. A peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend the interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. And yet, Slavery had existed undisturbed without war for four score years. How did impatience morph into this conflagration? That's how Lincoln, that's what Lincoln needed to address. If slavery had existed in the country for so many years, why now? Why this sacrifice? Why this devastation? Um, as he said, neither party expected the war, the magnitude or the duration Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. The secret ingredient was very simple for Lincoln. God. Lincoln was no longer, and the body politic were no longer in control of events. Lincoln was ready to take this extraordinary leap for his audience. And remember, it's an audience of soldiers and ordinary citizens. Both sides read the same Bible, or read the same Bible. Both pray to the same God. Each invokes his aid against the other. Um, and he had, and this, by the way, is the printed copy that he actually read from, with only a few edits. He liked having his, his uh, speeches printed in advance and preferred reading it. This one he cut into paragraphs and put on a long sheet of paper. He loved to cut and paste, which is interesting. So now he's going to get to the divine aspects of the suffering and the conflagration. It may seem strange, he tells the audience, that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not, lest we be judged. He's saying here that the slaveholders had invoked God for too long. And what's going to happen next is the fault of those who had misused divine intention. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. No explanation of where that's coming from, but again, the audience will recognize the scriptural origins. Now, here's the key part. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which in the providence of God, says Lincoln, must needs come, but which having to both north and south this terrible war, as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Now, if the audience is thinking that Lincoln is asking for mercy only, this is the part that I consider the most extraordinary part, a breathtaking part 
Slavery had offended God, said Lincoln, or he will, I'm paraphrasing. Woe to the world because of offenses, he says. That was from the book of Matthew. But it's not just the sin of the South. Lincoln is going to go beyond that. This is the powerhouse moment, the moment Frederick Douglass would admire the most. And this is what Lincoln says. Yet if God wills that the war continue until all the wealth piled by until all the wealth piled by the by the bondsman's toil, though the bondman's, I'm, I can't believe I'm messing up the key part, which I've announced as a key part. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the last shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, so as was said 3,000 years ago, still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And that's Old Testament fire and brimstone from Psalm 19. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous, or as Daniel Day-Lewis said it, righteous altogether. All of the wealth piled by the bondman's toil. If the war has to go on for 250 more years, that's what God has willed on an entire nation that tolerated the sin of slavery in different ways for so long, since the origin of the Republic. Um, a fire and brimstone damnation unlike anything ever pronounced from the US Capitol in a secular speech. And then, only then, suddenly, without transition, he didn't say, and now let me say something that will make you less nervous, or, and now let me close with a nicer thought. After saying, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, he then says, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who has who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan and to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. But I think the audience by that time had been just whipsawed back and forth between emotion and um, um, uh, divine retribution and this, I don't know how the audience reacted to this. By the way, one passing thing. Lincoln rehearsed his speeches out loud or had other people read them to him. I've known political leaders who do that. or It's a very wise thing because things sound different than they read often. And if you look at the very last few words here, the original that Lincoln wrote, a lasting peace among ourselves and with the world. It sort of falls flatter with the world. It doesn't have the rhythm he changed with the world to with all nations. He just had a great ear, um, and he knew how things would sound in public. And then he sat down. Did people cheer? We're not sure. There were rumors that there was sort of talk back, like in the black church during the speech, because it was, again, the first integrated inauguration audience. Um, silence greeted the Gettysburg Address also because of the fact that both speeches sounded um, much like a prayer. Later that day, and here's the scene, Frederick Douglass, a little bit older now as well, who had heard the inaugural, decided to go to the White House for the post-inaugural reception. Um, he was barred at the door by the guards. He tried again, he was barred at the door. What did Frederick Douglass do? He went to the side of the building and climbed through a window. <laughs> and as he put it, for the first time in my life, and I'm sure in the life of the Republic, a colored man attended the reception of a president on the evening of the inauguration. On the inside, and this is Douglass, I was taken charge of by two policemen who conducted me out the window Oh, I said, this will not do, gentlemen. Please say to Mr. Lincoln that Fred Douglas is at the door. In less than half a minute, I was invited into the East Room. I could not have been more than 10 feet from him when Mr. Lincoln saw me. 
His countenance lighted up, and he said in a voice that was heard all around the East Room, Here comes my friend Douglas. By the way, that sounds routine. It was not routine in 1865. In front of a bunch of, I mean, not a bunch, but hundreds of white people for the President of the United States to say, here comes my friend Douglas to a man of color. And then as Douglas remembered, Lincoln said, Douglas, I saw you, and, and Lincoln has a long reception line waiting to shake his hand, and he basically asks Douglas to break the line. We don't like that when it happens today, but you know, so the crowd probably was even angrier. Douglas, I saw you in the crowd today listening to my inaugural address. There is no man's opinion that I value more than yours. More than one witness said that. As if it wasn't enough that he called him his friend, he's now saying he values his opinion. This is quite a moment in American history. What did you think of it? Now there's a little of, you know, enough about you, let's talk about me, but still, it's an amazing moment. And Douglas replies, Mr. Lincoln, it was a sacred effort. Douglas got it. He understood what that speech meant. And Lincoln said to him simply before he was engulfed by the crowd, I am glad you liked it. Um, Douglas remembered it was the last time I saw him to speak to him, meaning he saw him in his coffin next. The speech itself became immediately reprinted and becomes quite a, uh, a, a, um, um, a popular speech, but it had plenty of critics. The newspapers, the New York Tribune wrote that it was um, too warlike. It was not forgiving enough. There was no humane spirit in it. It was as if Lincoln was saying, said Horace Greeley, this Haman shall hang on the gallows he erected for Mordecai, quoting the Old Testament himself. The pro-democratic New York Herald said he gave no information about his future policy. Um, the only, and here is Lincoln, two days after the inaugural address, when his little boy brings a photographer to the balcony of the White House to take his picture. He was in no mood to be, have his photograph taken that day. And you see he's sort of squinting against the wind on the, the March wind, which is sort of like the May wind in Vermont, I guess, um, as he's squinting in this, his only outdoor close-up photograph. He gets a letter from a New York political boss named Thurlow Weed. Thurlow Weed writes him a letter about um, a speech he's, uh, a, another speech, his acceptance of his official acceptance of notification of his election. And he says it's a neat little speech. Lincoln writes a letter that clearly shows how desperate he was for another compliment, like the one he'd gotten from Douglas. He writes, everyone likes a compliment. Thank you for yours on my recent inaugural address. Two things there. First of all, Lincoln always spelled it inaugural, inaug, E-R-A-L, which probably is the way he pronounced it. He was not a great speller. Second thing is, Thurlow Wee did not write to him about the inaugural address, but he was so eager for praise, so worried. I expect it to, to wear as well as perhaps better than any speech I have produced, but I believe it is not immediately popular. Men are not flattered by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. And maybe that's why it took so long for the second inaugural to take its place in Lincoln literature. It is a magnificent speech. It was the last great speech he made. Um, a few days, a, a few weeks later, he appeared on the balcony of the a window, second floor window of the White House to speak more, in more detail about Reconstruction. And that's the speech that Daniel Day-Lewis says, I wish I had had time to write a short one. But in fact, it was a very detailed plan at last. He didn't want to do that at the inaugural. He did it in front of a small group of people. And he said in that speech, going one step further, I think it is now time for us to consider giving the vote to the colored man, especially the very intelligent or those who have fought in the army. Now this is one of the lessons about looking at history through the right end of a telescope. 
not the wrong end. If you look at it through the wrong end of the telescope, oh my gosh, Abraham Lincoln is talking about IQ tests for people of color or only military men being allowed to vote. That's not the way a man in the audience saw it. Yes, the same John Wilkes Booth who had menaced him at his second inaugural was in the crowd at the White House that night and said, that means Negro citizenship. And he didn't use the word Negro, as you can imagine. That's the last speech he'll ever make. Three days later, Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln. So he died for that, for that um, final word on franchi enfranchising people of color and taking the inaugural one step forward. I'm gonna leave it to Frederick Douglass to summarize. As we've all heard recently, he's still doing a great job. Um, and he's also the subject of a great biography by my friend David Blight, who I think spoke in this very church a year or two ago on the subject of Frederick Douglass. Douglass said in writing his memoirs, in all my interviews with Mr. Lincoln, I was impressed with his entire freedom from popular prejudice, prejudice against the colored race. He was the first great man that I talked to in the United States freely, who in no single instance reminded me of the difference between himself and myself, or the difference of color. And I thought that all the more remarkable because he came from a state where there were black laws. I account partially for his kindness because of the similarity with which I had fought my way up. We both starting at the lowest rung of the ladder. Isn't it amazing that two contemporaries who had no schooling, who taught themselves reading, writing, and oration could emerge as the most eloquent 19th century people, um, the figures that did more to have inspired us than any. Lincoln never more so than when he delivered the speech that put America on notice that North and South shared guilt for the sin of slavery. And that malice toward none meant charity for all, black as well as white, as the only way to guarantee peace among ourselves. We may not have fully, certainly did not immediately absorb the lesson. Maybe Lincoln should have given a more direct speech instead of one that would be kind of perplexing in his day, but so magnificent that it demanded attention. Um, Lincoln thought that readers should see through uh, eloquence and oratory. Um, he once said to his small son, who had trouble comprehending a Shakespearean soliloquy, and asked his father, how do we explain it? And Lincoln simply said, my boy, it's all in the speech. I think in terms of reconsecrating America, as America's second declaration of independence, we have the Gettysburg Address, reconsecrating liberty and equality, and the second inaugural reminding us that America was founded not only on high principles, but on original sin. And we have a long way to overcome. Thank you very much.